Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter number 8. Genesis chapter number 8. Uh, we're going to live, we're going to live here today. Uh, 20 and 21 is, is, is where we're going to really, really uh, settle in this morning. We're beginning a series entitled, Come to the Altar. Come to the Altar. And over the next few weeks, I want to unpack this concept of having an altar experience. Now, altar, A-L-T-A-R, altar, that, that it is a noun, it is a place. Um, it is a place that is designated for God. It's a designated place for an encounter with the Lord, altar. Now, there is another altar, A-L-T-E-R, and that is a verb that means to change, that means to be shifted, to be moved. And I'm so grateful that there is a place where I can be shifted and I can, I can be altered at the altar. Do you understand what I'm saying this morning? I'm, did you know that there's a physical place where you can meet with God? There, there is a physical place where you can designate an encounter with the Lord. It, it, you, you can create a space with furniture. With, with furniture to encounter God. I, it, it's so funny to me in this generation, this culture of church that we're in today. I'm a young man, well, relatively speaking. I'm a middle man, uh, you know, 43 years old. But I was raised in the old school. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Old school. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Old school? Old school. I mean, if it made you grin, it must be sin. You understand? Old school. You, you understand? You, you didn't wear makeup, ladies. You didn't wear pants, ladies. You didn't cut your hair, ladies, because a woman's hair? Oh, y'all understand what I'm saying. Hallelujah. We, we didn't wear wedding rings. You didn't wear necktie. I'm telling you, holiness. It's holiness of hell, y'all. I was a young man. I was raised in the old school. We, we only preached from the King James Version ha, because any other version was a perversion. You understand? Uh, hallelujah. Uh, young man, old school. We had this part of our service, our worship experiences, every single Sunday where we had a time at the altar. The, the old church lived at the altar. The, the old church lived here. Everything about a service pointed to the altar. The, the, the beginning of the service was a call to worship so the worship could call you to the altar. The, the message was driven towards the altar. And you had just as much time as the, at the altar at the end of the service as you did through the whole duration of the service. Now, the way I came up, old man, young man, old school, old man, old school, doesn't matter however you want to take me. I, I came up that when it was altar time, the people who did not have an issue came forward to the altar. And the people with the issues, they stayed back in the seats. So that the people, the mothers and the fathers of the church, when they recognize people that normally come to the altar were not coming, they would get up and go get them and bring them to the altar. And we had this thing back in the old church where we called tarrying. We, we would tarry at the altar. This, there was no such thing as a drive-by deliverance. You understand? Lord, forgive me. Bam, it's over with. Lord, touch me. Bam, it's over with. Lord, heal me. Bam, it's over with. Now, you might get bam, 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 bam. But the mothers of the church, they were going to keep you there until they recognized true deliverance had been manifested in your life. And we knew that it didn't matter if it took 10 minutes or it took two hours. You were not leaving that altar the same way you came down. We, the old church lived here. They lived here. Now, now the, the issue back in my day with the old church is everything happened at the altar, which was awesome. But the problem was the change that happened in the altar never made it out the door. So, so you could have change at the altar, but if you got pulled over by the cop, he wouldn't know you just had a change at the altar. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Your, your language, you were speaking in tongues at the altar. 
and you speaking in another tongue in front of the police officer. Y'all, y'all so holy. Oh, Lord Jesus. Now, that was the issue with the old church that we saw. Today in the new church, the new school, is we were, we were so anti not living according to the change you declared at the altar that we just got them all out of here. So we removed them to provide more sitting. So that we could have large crowds, but the issue was you could have large crowds who never had an encounter. At least in the old church, you could have an encounter and he's still working on you. But now what we've done is we've gotten the place, the space for an encounter with God removed so that we can allow more sitting in the church. So there are large crowds, but nobody's being changed. We come to the house of the Lord, but nobody's having a genuine encounter with the one who the house was built for. So we have large crowds, but we've crowded out encounters. So I just want to remind us today by way of introduction, I I want us to understand that the reason you come to church is not to hear the preacher. Thank God, because I know you're a preacher personally. The, The reason you come to church is not to hear the worship. The reason you come to church is not because it's the most convenient to your subdivision. The reason we have a desire and a hunger for church, the deeper things, is because we desire an encounter with the Lord. I cannot wait after this series is over with. I'm going to come. I'm preaching a series entitled Come to Blessing where for the rest of the summer I'm going to break down the, the Beatitudes. Blessed are you. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Some of you are thirsting and you don't know what you're really thirsting for. You're you're looking for water, but there is a river of living water that wants to come spring up out of your belly. But but that's never going to happen. So we'll take a cheap um, uh, trick. We'll take a a cheap entertainment and light show and spectacle. and, And we get the preachers up here doing their song and dance trying to entertain us. But what you need is not entertainment. What you need is an encounter. This is where you'll never have to thirst again. This is where water flows. This is where bread is released in heaven. If I thank God for the preaching of the word, but if the preaching of the word does not lead us to an encounter with God, what you got is a great communicator, not an encounter. There's a space. And for some of us, God, this series is inviting us back to the altar. Some of us have never had an encounter with God. We had an encounter with church. We've had an encounter with spirituality. We've had an encounter with religious preferences. We've had an encounter with tradition. But none of those things change us. They may shape us, but they do not change us. Where change happens is at the altar where an encounter with God is waiting for you. This series is an invitation back to the place of an encounter. Everything points to the altar and by altar I mean encounter so when we're singing about the river of joy it's because before you leave this place that encounter oh what do you mean that encounter in the presence of the Lord when I'm in an encounter the presence of God his promise is that there is fullness That is right hand of pleasures forevermore. It's an encounter. It's not a song. It's an encounter. Now, now, for you to understand what happened. See, see, over the course of this series, I'm going to unlock the rewards of sacrifice. 
See, at the altar, sacrifice is required. The reason why we've crowded out the altars is because nobody wants to sacrifice anymore. We, oh, God, help me. Listen, this is the 11 o'clock, and I tell you guys every week, I don't know why you don't come to 9, because I'm much nicer than the 9 o'clock. That's easy. Sort of. The, the issue is, we call driving to church a sacrifice now. We, it's now a sacrifice to drive to church. I'm bringing you the sacrifice of gas. You can take that any way you want. But, but the issue is, you don't have to come to church. You get to come to the house of the Lord where His presence dwells. And to be around His presence is not to be an encounterer of it. I'm leading us through this series. In order to get you to do the rewards of sacrifice, I want you to understand the why today. And the best way for me to give you the why, to unpack the why, is to take us all the way back to the first altar. And that's found in Genesis chapter number 8, verse number 20. But let me give you some context this morning. And I took a lot longer in the first service than I'm going to take in the second service. I encourage you to, to go back and watch it if it's available. But this is the account of Noah in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. And, and he and his family, his, this was a blameless man. This was a righteous man. And he walked faithfully with God. He walked faith, faithfully with God. This is a man who wanted to live right. I've never met someone who comes to the house of the Lord that absolutely wants to rebel against God. In their heart of hearts, they want to please the Lord. They just don't want to give up everything to do it. I've never met someone who's just wicked and they show up. Now, I've been in services where witches have been. And they sat on the back row casting spells and praying against the, the preaching of the word. But that doesn't intimidate me at all. Because greater is he. So you can, you can cast your spell. You can work your root if you want to. You can just work it all the way out of here. If you mess with me, I cast the devil out. Hallelujah. You understand? Yeah, because of the, the power that works in me. Not me. Not my power. It's his power. So, so there's nothing that... You understand? But I've never met one who comes to church that desires to live wickedly. That's why we're here. That's why we come. That's why we watch it on live stream and we listen to the podcast later is because we have a desire to do what's right. And, and, and today, uh, it, the desire is to be righteous like Noah was. He was blameless in his generation. He walked faithfully with God. He tried to do what was right. And because of his faithfulness to God, verse number 13 says that God said to Noah, you see, this is very important for you to have today, is you've got to know the difference between what Glenn said and what God said. You got to know the difference between what you say and what you think and what God thinks. I, I, it's so it's so funny to me as I as I raise ministers of the gospel to rightly divide the sword of truth. It's so interesting to me how they can read a text and then they take longer giving their opinion than what they studied to find out what God meant. What well, I think He meant this. I could care less what you think. I want to know what He said, and let's decide what He thinks, and let's start there. Noah lived faithfully in his generation, and because he was faithful to God, he got a God said. He got a God said, and, and God told him throughout this over, over the course of the next few verses, he tells him, he says, I want you to build an ark. I, I'm sick of all of the sin that is in this generation, all the sin that is in this culture, all the sin that is in the earth today, and I'm going to wipe it out with calamity. And verse number 14 says, I want you to make an ark of cypress wood. I want you to build something. I want you to... Listen to me, Noah. I'm getting ready to bring a natural disaster to the earth. This is what I want you to do. I want you to live on your God said. And verse number 15 says, and this is the way I want you to build your God said. And for 80 years, some theologians believe it was upwards of 100. For 80 to 100 years, he built his God said. He built on his God said. He had no precedence. There was no conference to go to. There was no book to read. Tim the tool man Taylor didn't exist yet. 
You understand? He couldn't sit and watch Bob the Builder with his kids to figure out how to work a, a, a handsaw or a nail or a nail gun. or be a, He had no background for what God was saying. He did not know what it was that God was saying. He just knew that he had a God said. He was going on his God said. He didn't know what he was doing, but he had a God said. He, he didn't know where he was going, but he had a God said. He, he didn't know why he was having to do this, but he had a God said. He didn't know why God told him to come here, but he had a God said. He didn't know why God had a destiny on his life, but he had a God said. He just knew that God told him to do something. And for 80 to 100 years, he went on his God said. Went on his God said. On his God said. On his God said. On his God said for 80 years, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, building something he had no background for. Can you imagine? No days off, 80 years. Listen, let me help all of you. There was no DeWalt. Home Depot wasn't down the road. There was no Lowe's. There was no skill saw, no chop saw, no chainsaw, no hand saw. There was a stick with a rock that he would have to try to sharpen and go to work on his two by fours. I wanted to say two by twos because the animals went in two by two, but that'd have been corny. The two by four, he's just building them in. Day after day, he would drag them. He had no nails. He had no nail gun. He had to figure out what it was that God wanted him to build. And he did not have the resources to build what God had built for his convenience. But what he did do is he woke up every morning and said, God told me to do this. And I don't know why. And I'm not happy every single day. I don't know how many vacation days I'm going to get. I don't know how many family reunions I'm going to make it to. But what I am going to do is what God has told me to do. And people may not understand. Stand, but I'm going to build what God told me to do. He said in chapter 6, verse 22, I love this. Noah did almost everything that God commanded him. Noah did the majority of what God commanded him. Noah did it as long as it was convenient. Noah did it as long as it didn't make up, mess up his vacation schedule. Noah did it as long as it didn't create a budget issue. Noah, Noah did it according to command. You don't have to add in. What you have to do is go to work on your God said. Well, I have no background. Good. You have faith. I can't go to a conference to figure this thing out. Good. You have a prayer room. Go after your God said. See, see, this is not the time to be cute. This is the time to follow commands. This is not the time to take your creative liberties. This is the time to follow commands. How he told you to construct your marriage, construct your marriage. How he told you to raise the kids, raise the kids. How he told you to handle your job, Handle your job. How he told you to run your business, run your business. You don't hear what I'm saying. How he told you to minister with your gifts at the church, this is how you to minister your gifts at your church. Do all that he's commanded you to do. And let me tell you one thing he's not commanded you to do is sit and wait for the Holy Spirit's wind to blow the ark together. I'm preaching in this bad because of church. Miss family outings. Don't you know? This guy's building a massive build, a boat. Rain has never fallen on the earth from the clouds. That God, at the very beginning, he, he allowed the, the, the vegetation to be saturated with the morning dew and the evening dew. He watered it from inside of itself, not from outside. No one in the town or the village had ever seen rainfall, but he's sitting there saying, God told me rain was coming, and I've got to build this God said over our life because my God said is what's going to create safety for my family. Don't you know he was a crazy uncle? There's Noah.
There's Noah. He's at it again. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade. Cranking away. Building something that he has no background for and displaying it in front of people that have no idea what he's doing. Let me tell you why I don't get upset at people when, when they don't understand what it is that God's doing in my life. Because I learned a long time ago that if it took God to tell me what to do, it's going to take God to reveal to them why I'm doing it. In other words, it's not going to make sense to everybody because it took God to explain it to me. How in the world am I going to be able to explain it to somebody else? I am nowhere. It took deity and divine intervention to get it through my thick skull. How in the world do I think I'm going to persuade anybody to understand what God is doing in my life? I don't have time to explain to everybody what it is because every moment I'm sitting here trying to get people to get on board with me, uh huh. Every time I'm sitting here trying to change their opinion about me, I'm wasting time and energy on my God said of what He has decreed and declared me to do. So if they can't understand me, I bless them. I pray God's prosperity over their life. But I'm going to ask God to reveal to them what it took God to explain to me. This is the time to follow commands. I learned this lesson over the past three or four years. It, people's opinion about what God's doing in my life is none of my business. People's opinion about what God's doing in my life is none of my business. It, it's, it's none of my business. And the Bible says in chapter 7 that God told Noah after 80 years, go in. Go in. I want you to enter in to your God's head. For 80 years, you've been building something. And now, the season to enter it is here. I've asked you to build something for 80 years. That you're going to dwell in now that it's built. Moses, go tell my people to come out of captivity because my God said for them is that there is a land that is flowing with milk and honey. But I'm so glad that God doesn't give me a God said to just get me out. He also gives me that God said to take me in. It's one thing to come out because you have a land flowing with milk and honey. It's another thing, honey, to step into the land that's flowing with milk and honey. And I'm so glad that God doesn't entice me with something I'm never going to see. But I'm going to, like David, see the promises of God right here in the land of the living. That what he said he was going to do in my life, it shall come to pass. Now go in. Go, go in. Verse number 5 says, And Noah did it all. He did it all. He, he did it all as the Lord commanded him. H have, you, have you ever asked God, been asked by God to build something for which you have no point of reference? Ha, ha, it's one thing to build your God said. It's another thing to enter into it. It's one thing for God to say he's going to heal you. It's another thing to enter into healing. It's one thing for him to say he's going to deliver you. It's another thing to walk in deliverance. Y'all hear? It's one thing to say he's going to help you walk away from that pain. It's another thing for you to walk in the peace that's beyond that pain. The question I have to ask you today is, is, are you building what you want to enter into? See, it's so funny to me, so funny to me how people will build things they don't want to be in. God gave you that spouse. You got married because of a God said. 
Oh, it got tight in this Holy Ghost filled church. <laughs> and it's going to take you 80 years to fix that man. I'm just telling you. It's going to take you 80 years. And it may be 79 years and 364 days before that boy becomes a man. Hallelujah. And for 80 years you've been, and, but you've been building it, but you don't want to really enter into it. It's a marriage you're in, but you don't want to be in. It's a marriage you've built, but you don't want to be in it. It's a covenant that you made, but you don't want to be there. Well, our marriage is just so jacked up. Well, who built it? What? Question number one, was it a God said? Because he is the author and... But don't ask him to finish what he didn't write. So the first thing we need to find out is if it was a God said. And if it is a God said and you're building it according to his plan, why wouldn't you want to be in it? Then either he didn't say it, or you're taking your creative liberties in it. <laughs> our, our children don't want to enter into our home. Well, for the most part, they're innocent and naive, for the most part. But they don't want to, they don't want to enter in. To, what did we build? Why would we build something that our children don't want to be in? How, come on, y'all. Either God didn't say it, or we're taking too much creative liberty. And by creative, I mean selfish. You, you hear what I'm saying this morning? If God said it, build it according to plan. Build your marriage the way God said it. Let me, oh, I, I don't know why I'm hitting this this morning the way I didn't do this in the first service. But, but, when, wives, submit to your husbands. And tell me what to do. That's fine. And you wonder why he's not entering into, but he's entering, never mind. Do you understand what I'm saying? Submit to your husbands. Uh -uh, it ain't over. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And until you're hanging on a cross, butt naked, bleeding, and exposed for everybody to see out of embarrassment and shame, you ain't going through enough stuff yet. Let me go to my notes and move on from this. Because we have to enter in to what we've built. And if you don't like what you've built, then, then was it... Surely God didn't build that dysfunction. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I, Listen, let me balance it because I feel the room. That does not mean you put up with abuse. That does not mean you put up with abuse. That does not mean you sit around and you get the snot beat out of you every single day. That does not mean he gets to beat with anybody he wants to and still. I'm not... Let's be, let's, let's, come on. Use, use, our, use, our, use common sense. He's not building it according to design. All right. This, this is why Judah is so important to me. Because I have to build it according to design. But why would I build you see this in church all the time where the pastor's wife is the most miserable person in the church because walking in like she's smelling something can't talk to nobody has an attitude all the time and you know she don't amen her past her, her husband 
Why would I want to build a church my, my family doesn't want to be in? Do you, do you understand? Do you understand? If, if, I, if this was a God said, and I'm building it according to design, I want us to enter in. Okay. All right. So verse 17 of chapter 7 says this. And then as soon as he built it, the rains came. For 40 days, the flood, I love this, kept coming on the earth. It kept coming for 40 days. Day after day, the storm came. He built his God said, he entered into it, and then the storm came. Now, I don't know how you feel about this, but this bothers me just a little bit. Because in my opinion, if I spent 80 years building something, at least give me a minute to appreciate it. You know what I'm saying? Like, give me, like, give me a week off, homie. You know what I'm saying? Like, like let me walk around and go, y'all are just pretty good. Oh, yeah. It, it is. You have no idea what it's for. I don't really know what it's for, but God said to do it. And, you know, like, like, let come down from heaven and say, this is my Noah in whom I'm well pleased. You know what I'm saying? Like, come down and say, and it was good. I mean, do something. Give me a minute to take a break. Let me go to the beach for a weekend. Let me go to the mountains at least for a weekend. Let me go, you understand? I hadn't seen the, the leaves change colors in 80 years. At least let me go to the Appalachian Mountains and watch the leaves change before. No, as soon as he finishes, God said his storm came. You see, the reason you need to understand God gives you a God said is because he knows the storm that's coming. You have to understand that there is a purpose behind his God said so that you can survive your storm. Have you ever met people going through something and they just give up and give in all the time? They live in that victim mentality and they're just waiting to die. Why? Because they haven't realized they still have a God said. And the God said they've been going after is to help them in the safety of their storm. My God said was to get me through my storm. For 40 days. The waves came, flooded the earth. Now, can you imagine? He's the crazy uncle. He's the weird guy in, in the neighborhood. He's the guy in town that everybody makes jokes about. And now the rain has come. And all of those people who thought he was stupid... Let us in. Hey, 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 no, 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 help, 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 no, 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 help me, help me, Noah, no, 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 help me, no, 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 it's about to be goodbye. Help me, Noah. Noah, 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 I need you, Noah. I need you, Noah. I need you, Noah. All these people that made fun of him are now begging to get in his boat. Now, I don't know how you feel, but the carnal side of me? Keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Woo! Keep a knocking, but you can't come in. Swim back later and try it again. <laughs> right? right? I mean, yeah, right? Where were you when I'm dragging all this wood? I mean, you couldn't swing a hammer one day? You couldn't cut part of this? For one day, you couldn't help me with all this pitch that I had to do inside of that for one day. Where were you when I was lugging all the feed for the animals that are coming in here? And now you begging me? Nah, homie. I'm good. Homie, don't play that. Homie, the clown. No. Listen. Listen. But Noah was righteous in his generation. Noah wasn't sitting there going, nanny, nanny, boo, boo. Keep it knocking, but you can't come in. Shut the door, keep out the devil. He, he wasn't doing it. He was righteous in his generation. And with every hit, he knew that there was nothing he could do because God was the one who closed the door. He had a God said. 
and now his storm is here and God has put him in an ark of safety and he's shut the door for him and, and the people are begging, the people are knocking, the people are screaming for rescue and salvation and the storm is coming and the floods are here and people are drowning one by one and with every hit his heart is breaking, with every hit his heart is aching, with every hit he's dying on the inside because he knows there's nothing he can do for the people that he loves. It's his mama, it's his daddy, it's his brothers, it's his sisters, it's his cousins, it's his nephews, it's his nieces, nieces, and there's nothing he can do. And the only thing worse than the slamming and the knocking of the people that are out there is when they go silent. Because they no longer exist. The only thing that thundered louder than the banging and the pleading of the people he loved was the screaming silence of their death. For 40 days, the souls of those people he'll never see again live in his mind. The banging, ringing in his ears is now all from memory because they no longer exist. There's no more children screaming outside. It's just Noah and his wife. Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. And that's it. For 40 days, they're being rocked. How did they survive when everyone else drowned? They dwelled in their God said. When the storm came. And now the rain has descended, it stopped. For 40 days now, for the next year, the, Bible, the theologians say that it was 370 days that, the, that Noah and his family were in the ark total, 40 days. So the, the other 330, almost an entire year of just drifting between mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. For an entire year drifting between mountains and valleys. Mountains and valleys. And God says in Genesis chapter 8 verse 15, I'm at the end, come on Jamal. Now Noah... You've been drifting from peaks to valleys for a year now. I'm settling you in to your new place. Come out, verse 16 says. Come out. I've been building this for 80 years. I survived a storm in this for 40 days. I floated through peaks and valleys for another year. And now you're telling me that this is no longer a part of my life? Come out. What do you do when your whole life has existed for one thing? And now God is saying, it's a new season and that has now become irrelevant. The Bible says in verse number 20, that when Noah came out, go ahead, throw it up there for me, Tim. Noah built an altar. Hang on. See, we come to church and we say, that there is already space for the altar. And, and 
Maybe there is even a piece of furniture that we call the altar. But just because I have a piece of furniture here that looks like an altar, it does not mean you built an altar for an encounter. Just because there's a piece of furniture that looks like your tradition that is now available to you does not mean that it is a given that an encounter is going to happen here. The Bible says that Noah built an altar. He built an altar. I love this. The Lord showed me this Friday. I'd never seen it before. I preached this, a version of this over the course of 20 years. I'd never seen this before. No, God spoke to Noah and gave him specific designs for the ark. but said nothing to him about how to build the altar. You see, when you've spent 80 years building a God set, nobody has to tell you how to build an altar. When, when you've endured day after day, week after week, month after month, I feel the Holy Ghost, year after year, decade after decade, and you don't know why you're doing what you're doing except God told you to do it. And you don't know why you're enduring what you're enduring, but you're, God told you to do it. And you don't know why people are ostracizing you, but you know God told you to do it. And you don't know why people are leaving you, but, but God told you to do it. And, and you go day after day on your God said, and week after week on your God said, and year after year on your God said, and decade after decade on your God. Nobody has to teach you how to build an altar. If you know how to build your God said, you know how to build an altar. Eighty years I've been doing this thing. And if I'm coming out, I gotta have a place for a new encounter. So I'm gonna take my 80 years of fighting the good fight of faith. I'm gonna take my 80 years of loneliness. I'm gonna take my 80 years where I feel like I've been doing it by myself. I'm going to take my 80 years and I'm going to bring all that pain to a place where I can have an encounter with God. Because if I made it through 80 years, all of the God said, I don't want to make it one day in a new place without one. I don't want to go one day without a God said in my new place. I, I, I'm going to build my altar. For 80 years, he went on a God said. And for 40 days, he went through a storm. I watched this relationship die in this storm. I lost my father in this storm. I lost my mother in this storm. I, lo I lost in this storm. I, lo I lost. I lost my cousin. I lost my niece. I lost my nephew. I lost my brother. I lost my sister. This storm that I barely survived has taken out almost everyone that I hold dear. It wiped out my house in 40 days. It wiped out my job in 40 days. Yeah, I'm going to bring my 80 years of living on my God said. But I'm going to bring him a part of my storm too. Because if I can make it through a storm, I don't want to spend one moment in the sunlight without a God said again.
build an altar. The Bible says that he lifted there. He lived in it. Drifting between peaks and valleys as the water rescinded. Anybody in this room ever felt like you were just drifting? About the time you got to a mountain, before too long you just rode a fast current down to a valley. Anybody know what I'm talking about today? He said, if I can make it through the peaks and the valleys, I'm not making it in this new place without an encounter with God. I'm going to build an altar. Altars are not pretty. God does not come for pretty encounters. He's looking for someone who will build their place that they can encounter. Oh, what, what does that mean? So glad you asked. Watch this. Um, I just came to bless your name. I just came to give you praise. You have been so good to me. And I'm going to bless your name. He doesn't show up because singers sing. He shows up for an encounter when somebody says, you know what, for 80 years, I've been by myself. Doing this thing by myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bless the Lord at all times. And His praise is going to continually be in my mouth. So I'm by myself, but I came to bless your name. And I, I, I've gone through being made fun of, but I came to give you praise. And I don't know what it is that you're doing. All I got is to go on is a God said, but I'm going to give you the glory that you deserve today. I'm going to take this song and I'm going to build it with my testimony. And I'm going to build a place for me and you to have an encounter. Uh. Uh, Abba Abba Father He loves me Abba Father He holds me Abba Father Takes care of me He doesn't show up because you called his name He shows up because somebody For 40 days your storm has happened and you lost your father in the middle of this storm. You lost your son in the middle of this storm. You lost your child in the middle of this storm. You lost your wife in the middle of the storm. You, you, lost, you see, that's the hardest thing about a pastor. The hardest thing about pastoring is, is everybody else wants you to be there for them in their storm. But when you're going through your own storm, you have nobody that you can lean on. But I want you to know today, you're talking to somebody that survived a storm. So when I hear him say that Abba Father loves me, I know that to be true because I had nothing else to hold on to in the greatest storms of my life. So it's easy for me to build an altar when he promised he would be a father to the fatherless and a mother to the motherless. It's a place where I can build off of. I can build. When you've gone through the vicissitudes of life, the peaks and the valleys, the highs and the lows, the triumphs and the tragedies. And it seems like it's one to none, one to none, one to none, one to none. And there's nothing in between. That's when you can say things like, you're overwhelming, never ending, reckless love for me, chases me.
here. See, we all can be in the same service, and only a few of us can have a genuine encounter. The difference is not the song. The difference is, did you build your place to have an encounter? Noah comes out. <laughs> he comes out. out and he gets to his place of encounter and he looks at God and he says you make all things new you make all things new right here I will follow you and you may have thought I'd be an ostracized but you know that you have a God said I want you to get up on your feet right now say I, I got a God said I, I know that God's told me some things about my life there's some things in my life that I, that I know I, and I'm building it you see some trusted horses and some trusted chariots but we trust in the name materials this morning say pastor I'm in one of the biggest storms of my life I'm going through one of the biggest storms of my life I'm watching relationship drown after relationship drown I'm watching things get washed away after being washed away you're in this room and you say pastor I'm in a storm or maybe pastor I just come through a storm I want you to stand all over this room on your feet if you're in this room today you say I'm in a storm you see if you're in a storm you got the right material to have an encounter storm. Let me tell you, those of you that are in a storm, watch this. You're in this room and you've gone through a storm and you thought it was going to take you absolutely out had it not been for your God said, raise your hand. Look at all these testimonies. Look at all these testimonies. You're going to make it. <laughs> Just keep going on your God said, you're going to make it through the storm. I feel the presence of a Jehovah God in this room today. You're going to make it through this storm. He's given you, this 
storm has given you the right materials for an altar and encounter. You're in this room. You say, Pastor, I just feel like I'm going peaks and valleys, up and down. Yo, 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 yo. I get it all together, then it all falls to pieces. I get it all together, it all falls to pieces, and I just feel like I'm floating. Peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. I just want you to raise your hand in the room today. That's me, that's just me. I feel like I'm yo-yoing back and up and down, up and down, up and down. Full of faith, full of fear, full of faith, full of fear. There you go, you can put it right back down. Listen, 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 hear me, God, hear me. Please hear me, please hear me. You have the right material for an encounter. If we were in battle, they would call this fodder. You got the right material for an encounter. What we got to do is get you in, 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 into a place for an encounter where you're not more focused on what you've lost than what you still have. You see, Noah built an altar, not a cemetery. He built an altar, not a shrine. He, he built an altar for a new encounter, not a place to remind God of what he's lost. Let me tell somebody in this room today, you've been pressed, but you are not crushed. You've been persecuted, but you are not abandoned. And you might have even been struck down, but you're not destroyed. And you may be half dead, but you're still half alive too. And you're still standing here today. And you've got the material for an encounter in a new place. Here we go. i got to hurry. i got a plane to catch. Before we leave here, I want you to grab your God said right now. Grab your God said. Grab it, grab it, grab it. Grab your God said. I'm watching people hold. I'm, I'm watching people grip it. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to hold their peace right now. Woo. Somebody needs to hold their peace. It's tangible. If you got a God said, I want you to use your voice right now and thank Him for it. Right now in Jesus' name. Remind Him what He said to you. Remind Him that there's nothing lacking, there's nothing missing. Remind Him that you're healed. Remind Him that you're restored. Remind Him that you're renewed. Remind Him that He's for you. Remind Him that the anointing comes even without repentance. Remind Him that you're a child. Oh God, remind Him you're His son. Remind Him that you're His daughter. Remind Him of what He promised you over your children. Of what He's promised you over your grandchildren. Of what He's promised you over your finances. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Come Anybody ever been in a storm? Anybody ever been in a storm? Anybody ever been in a storm? I want you to thank Him for the storm right now I want you to confuse your enemy Father I thank you for every tear I cried Father I thank you for every person that broke my heart I thank you for every person that swore they'd never leave and they walked out anyway I thank you for every time I've been afraid I thank you for every time I've been stressed out and anxiety has tried to grip me I thank you, Lord, for every time I've been called back to bondage and addiction. I thank you for every time the enemy tried to steal my joy and steal my peace and steal my love and steal my happiness. I thank you for that season of depression. Woo. I thank you for that season of loneliness. But if I had not had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. 
and I wouldn't know what faith in God could really do. Now if you say, I had a storm, but I'm still standing. I dare you to give him a praise in this room. So hold hold up. So what you did is you came here to the pretty one. I want you to give him a praise because you're still standing. I want you to give him a praise because you're still here. He tried to take out your life, but you're still here. He tried to take out your marriage, but you're still here. He tried to take out your home, but you're still here. He tried to take out your health, but you're still here. He tried to take out your joy, but it's still here. He tried to take out your peace, but it's still here. 